Like with the Politoed video, Noctowl is another one of those Pokemon that I feel get kind of swept under the rug as the years go on, and initially I was really excited to see what this could do, because if you look at it on paper, it seems like it could really have a lot of potential. Normal types with early things like Stab Headbutt and Return, along with the Flying Typing getting that early Flying Type damage boost from Faulkner's Badge, it could be great. Couple that with Noctowl not having an abysmal low speed stat, and not being cursed with that slow leveling group, I thought that Maybe we were on track for a certified banger, but let's let's stop huffing the copium and let's go over what the reality is. And I have a lot that I could say here, but I want to keep it light so I'm not starting the video ranting and raving like a conspiracy theorist. But I'll just tell you one thing to get us started, and that's the fact that Noctowl only has 50 base attack. Now this is tied with other very well-known physical attackers like Oddish and Cubone, and what this means is that this little bird boy is... It's, it's gonna hit like a piece of tissue paper. Let's be real with ourselves. So at the beginning of the game, I'm gonna be fighting Youngster Joey, Mikey, Don, Wade, a couple of wild battles. And you might be thinking that this prep is for Faulkner, but ladies and gentlemen, it was actually for Bird Keeper Abe, the very first trainer in Faulkner's gym. Now maybe it's just me, but when I tried coming here at level six, I got ripped in half and this sparrow just took my lunch money like a bully that peaked in high school that still talks about the glory days. But I think the fact that I had to grind for this specific battle should kind of cue you in on how this run felt to prep for, but let's just dive into Faulkner. There's really not much to this battle. It's actually easier than the Sparrow Trainer, but when you have Growl, you can put that on each Pokemon. You have the Berry for that massive effective HP increase. I can just slowly chip away, but it is still pretty close. That's gonna be a theme today, but there's no need to get past level 10 or go to level 10. Just don't overthink it, get the first badge. After the fight, I do learn Mud Slap. Now this bad little 20 base power move is something that Noctowl will, it'll use more than most runs, but it is important. Something else that's very important is an early pink bow. Now, never mind my very bad overworld movement that you'll see here. But when you have a, a attack stat that's only slightly higher than Onyx, you need all the help you can get. Plus we get to see that beautiful pink bow on the overlay early, which is always a plus. Now let's get into Noctowl's second issue and it's the moves. You are funneled and forced into utilizing only your 50 base attack and you essentially can't access your decent special attacks at all. And why is that? For the level up moves, you do get confusion, which is a pretty weak move in general without stab. And at level 41, a 50 base power move just doesn't really do that much. And then when you hit the ripe level of 57, which you'll basically already be in Kanto at that point, you're gonna get Dream Eater. Now I've gotten a lot of Dream Eater comments over the years and guys, I think we need to just accept the reality that it's not a very good move. Even in Gen 1 where sleep is massively overpowered, it relying on your opponent needing to be asleep as a prerequisite, it just lowers its value a ton. But in Gen 2, where sleep has been nerfed significantly, it's just that much worse. And when you look at the TMs, once again, Dream Eater, it's the one single move that uses our special attack, and that's it. The only other thing that we can use is Hidden Power, and that's more of like a specialized tool that you're gonna use to problem solve, but the 50 base attack, and the way Gen 2 forces you to only use that, that was the real big limit factor for the run. Now I do get some help here in the form of Swift, which is a big upgrade over Tackle. I take on the Slowpoke Well segment, and I will be taking on Bug Catcher Beanie. He has the B drill inside of Bugsy's gym. That's going to be our only optional battle, and now we can just take a look at Bugsy. I have the top advantage here, and Pet can really put in some work with that super effective damage. Scyther, normally problematic. It's still going to go for Fury Cutter here, but it's resisted, which means I don't really have to heal. I can easily outpace it, and overall it's just a pretty easy second badge, but I do hit 16 near the end, and that's when I get access to Hypnosis. In my humble opinion, Hypnosis is the one saving grace that saves this Pokemon from being a really bad Pokemon, and it's going to let our little Nocturnal Owl get past challenges that it has no business getting past. Hopping directly into rival number two, I'm gonna use Mud Slap on Ghastly, even though Peck does more damage. I do this just so I up my chances to avoid hypnosis due to the accuracy drop. It works out here, and what I want you to notice about this fight, and pay attention here, is that I got the strat I wanted. It worked exactly how I drew it up, and it's still a little bit of a struggle. Zubat uses supersonic, like it tends to do, and it's not like I hurt myself a million times. I do hurt myself twice, but that's enough to make this battle come down to the wire. I go down to just five health, I barely win, but the important thing is I, I survive. 
And the real unfortunate thing here is that usually this is where help is on the way in the form of Headbutt, but Noctowl doesn't have that luxury. Even though Headbutt itself is a way to get Hoot Hoot and Noctowl in the wild, and Noctowl has a pretty big head, Game Freak said no to our feathered friend, but I do get some luck and Goldenrod. I get a pretty rare plus 10 friendship haircut. Now I'm not sure about the odds for this, I'm not gonna look it up, but generally I always get the plus one or the plus three variants. And this is a very welcome stroke of luck considering how much this Pokemon wants return and normally I wasn't able to get it. I do defeat Fire Breather Walt and then near the Pseudo Widow I pick up Psychic Mark, Schoolboy Allen, and that's gonna get me ready for Whitney. Let me just say that I could not fathom what this fight would look like without hypnosis in your back pocket. Keep in mind that even if we had 150 friendship right now and we had return, 150 friendship means that return would be doing the same exact damage as Swift, so there's very little difference. In the grand scheme of things, Clefairy doesn't really matter unless maybe it metronome thunder or something like that, but let's move ahead and talk about Miltank. We are outsped, number one. It has rollout, number two, and it's really going to ramp up against our pathetic 50 base defense, and that's really the huge issue. The answer is hypnosis. Now to sweeten the pot even further, I generally go for at least four debuffs to the cow's accuracy with mud slap, and that just increases my chances to not get hit. And it goes without saying that this battle kind of leaves things up to chance. And I'm gonna have some resets. I'm gonna have two in total, and at this point you guys know what needs to happen to win, but let me kind of rant to you for a second. I've thought about this for a while, but Whitney more than any other trainer I've ever fought in any Pokemon game is the one that like egregious just doesn't care about accuracy the most. The amount of times that I've had her at like six stages of lowered accuracy and she just hits stomp after stomp without caring, it's alarmingly and suspiciously high. This one is pretty frustrating and I know Whitney and her meal tank is kind of like a meme because she murders so many beginner players, but I want you guys to test this out for yourself and let me know what you think about the accuracy here and how Whitney ignores it. But two resets, I eventually get it down. What can you do? Not as bad as it could have been without hypnosis. The normal top damage boost, it's great from getting the badge, but more importantly, that plus 10 haircut was something I did not plan for, but this means I can go ahead and pick up return. And let me just reiterate, I did not route to have return this early, but for now it's not really significant, and let me tell you why, but first, let's watch my favorite animation in any game, it's when you run from the pseudo widow, it's truly the best thing in the game, it just blasts off. But now we're going to be getting into that territory where there are some struggles, and the problem with Gen 2 and limited Pokemon is that you only have one get out of jail free card. Now you can see hidden power on the right, it is going to be ice top for this run, but to lay out the really problematic parts of the game in no specific order, uh, Rival 3, 4, 5, they're all pretty rough, Morty's a problem, Jasmine can be a wall, and then down the line in the Elite 4 you have some issues specifically with Lance, and obviously red is going to be something kind of looming over the whole run. Now remember, I banned Curse. I don't want to funnel nearly every Pokemon into the same boring end game strategy, so it's banned. It's something I don't really talk about that much in my videos, but it's always in the description and I don't want to like harp on it too much. But what all these problems come down to is that you only get one hidden power top, but you have a handful of awful fights to get through. So hidden power ground, it solves all the rival fights and it solves Morty, and I think that's more like a short term band-aid to eliminate a lot of that early to mid game grinding. But in my opinion here, I think it's a little bit short sighted to go that route because it's like pretending that the late game problems don't exist and let me tell you right now Lance will absolutely crush you if you don't have hidden power ice so with that information and insight I'm going to be going on a bit of a grinding spree and first I'm gonna head east I'm gonna get hidden power and I'm gonna pick up a couple of battles we're gonna fight hiker Benjamin and there's three Pokemaniacs here Brent Ron and Ben they all have a single Pokemon pretty good experience next I'm heading towards Olivine for more training I'm gonna pick up bird keeper Toby Psychic Norman, I'm gonna get the Mint Berry, I'm gonna get an early sharp beak from Monica, and we're gonna fight Sailor Huey, that's gonna be my final optional battle in the Lighthouse. And now I'm going to do what I think is the earliest use of Rare Candies I've ever done. I hit 28 at the very end of this little detour, I'm gonna use my candies here, I got two, I'll be up to 30, and now we can talk about rival number three. For Haunter, you're never gonna one-shot it without a crit, so Curse is just part of life at this point, and it's gonna be a race against the clock, essentially, and level 30, it gave me the best ranges. 
Now two things to note is that one, I still have Mud Slap, but it can't one shot the Magnemite, so that's why I just go for return here. And more importantly, the rival does not have the main antagonist of the run yet, Thunder Wave on its learn set. I two shot it, return is an easy one shot on Zubat, and it's a guaranteed two shot on Croconaw. And even though this fight went exactly how I wanted it to, exactly how I drew it up on paper, even though I trained a lot, even though I used the candies, notice that I only survived this battle with just 30 health, but let's not dwell on that, let's go to the next battle. For Morty, I do have the Mint Berry ready to go, and I can one shot the first Ghastly, but the very first Haunter also has Curse, so even though I got a guaranteed two shot and I move first, Curse is once again, it's just part of life, we have to deal with it. Now with Curse ready to tick, and Gengar not even being a guaranteed three shot, my only hope here is an immediate Hypnosis, even though I'm at full health. And I want you to keep paying attention to this battle to see why. Now I get the Hypnosis immediately, and even though I get a crit, Gengar barely survives on just a single hit point. And that means I'm going to take another spoonful of curse damage, which takes me down to yellow health. Now we've seen how much damage curse does already, maybe you wasn't paying attention. And this is going to be a photo finish, because curse is going to tick and take me down to exactly one health. But the Haunter doesn't go for damage, it only looks at me in like a really mean way, which means Hooter hangs on, and we get an improbable victory. And I don't want to be a broken record, guys. I'm, I'm telling you, Noctile is deceptively frail. If you look at the 100 base HP and its special defense, you would think that, hey, this is a pretty big tank, but we've seen countless times already that I get a fight go exactly how I want it to go, and I still barely survive. But on the bright side, glass half full here, I do think that this was probably the roughest stretch of the run, probably from Whitney up to the extra training and all the way to Morty, and things are going to pick up just for a little bit. I'd also like to talk about split data. Now I didn't talk about it earlier because let's be honest this one's a wash. The comparison here is to Lugia and you can see already after four gems this little burb is already 36 minutes behind in the hole and that's okay. Not every run could be a certified banger top three finish type of run but it just means that I don't think we need to look at the split data for the rest of the run. Noctow is just too far behind to compete but I am interested in maybe some opinions on that. I think it's better to have like a streamlined approach where I just keep it real with you guys and I say hey this Pokemon's too far behind we don't have to look at the split data three or four times this run but if you think I should I would like to hear your opinion on that but that's about it after that it is time for a brisk swim down to cyanwood and before you know it it's time for a little Chuck, brother Despite the fact that we are a flying type Pokemon with a super effective flying move, this isn't a guaranteed battle. Primeape is whatever, but remember that we are only neutral to fighting moves. Now give me a comment below if you thought flying types were actually immune to fighting below, because I, I thought that back in the day. But this one is going to come down to Hypnosis. You either use Hypnosis or you get put to sleep, and I have the Mint Berry still here because I saved it from the last fight, just in case things went south. Now I actually forget, I always forget that Chuck has a full restore, but things are pretty smooth, and we don't have to cry about how much damage Dynamic Punch hits us for when we have lowered defense, so that's pretty cool. After the battle, I get access to fly, and I'm gonna backtrack. I'm gonna get the PP up, a couple of rare candies, a nugget. I'm gonna get the charcoal to sell, but that doesn't really matter. What does matter is that this is the type of run where I'm actually gonna use fly on my main Pokemon. I actually didn't pick up Kenya for this run, so maybe this will be the day that it actually gets delivered this time. It's that time of the video where Lance hyper beams multiple humans and no one says anything about it, no one cares. But I would like to focus on Scientist Jed today. Jed is the reason that I have not learned Hidden Power Ice just yet, and it's the reason that we still have Mud Slap this deep into the run. Now if you haven't noticed, Noctile has nothing for Steel Tops, and imagine my shock in the blind run when Jed turned out to be a raid boss. But that's really about it for this section, let's move on. In Prices Gym, I'm going to be battling every single trainer, and all of them have ice damage, and it's not ideal, but it's really not too bad, and I'm not fighting them because Price is hard, you might think that since he's the ice type gym leader, but if you look at the battle, I don't even heal, I'm not even really worried about it. I can just make it through, take a little damage here and there, and at the end, Piloswine does have Blizzard, but it's fairly weak, I do think I could survive, but if Price ever had a chance to kind of show us what he's made of, it's right now, so what does he do? He goes for Fury Attack, does 10 damage and he dies like the degenerate that he is. Next up is Jasmine, and I do have a reset due to bad hypnosis luck and iron tail, but it's not that interesting to look at. One reset. 
So here's the strat, I have Hypnosis. If I get one of the Magnemites to go to sleep, and then I two-shot it, and then I can just use the Paralyzed Cure Berry on the next to stop Thunder Wave, I can just get past the worst part of the fight. Now here, I want to see if I can maybe preserve my berry, so I go for Double Hypnosis. It's a little risky, but it pays off. And you might be surprised that Steelix and Iron Tail damage combined with the Full Restore can actually just still 1v1 you. Maybe if Jasmine doesn't miss or gets that defense drop. Now overall, Hidden Power Ice is a three-shot, and with 50 base attack and Steelix having like 400 defense, it's just the superior option here. One reset is about what I expected, so there's no complaints for me. But after the battle, we get that dreaded phone call. Only me and you, and I'm specifically talking to you right now, only we can stop Team Rocket. And today, I actually have a few things to say about it. First up is this penis head scientist Mark. Now, I just want to know, who thought that scientist equal Magnemite? It's very annoying. Now, this guy, he just exists to make me roll my eyes in the back of my head. And I want everyone to comment, thanks, scientist Mark, down below, because he really put up a fight. There's also the third rival here, and we generally never look at the later rivals, but here we are. Golbat is a clean one-shot, and I actually forgot my paralyzed cure berry that I saved earlier. And rather than reset or something like that, I just went back to hypnosis. Now, it works out here. I get to save the berry once again, which is actually a pretty big time save that I'll talk about after this, but the only real thing that happens here is I miss Fly on Haunter, I get cursed, and it ends up making what should have been a really easy finish be much closer than you would think, but that's pretty much it for the Rocket Takeover. Next up, let's quickly hit on the vitamins for the run. The main thing is six carbos. It lets me hit the speed break points that I need going forward, and I finish up with a couple of proteins here and there. And before I go into the eighth gym, let me talk about the Paralyzed Cure Berry in detail. There's a second Paralyzed Cure Berry that I was routing in, and you can find it south of Blackthorn. It's a little bit out of the way, but you don't have to fight any trainers. There's a clear, straight line path straight to it, and it's just really helpful in a run where there's so many opportunities for Thunder Wave to ruin your life. But since I played bad today and I forgot the use of the first berry multiple times, I don't even have to get it. So it was a little bit of like serendipitous top luck that just saved me some time. As for Claire, Never Melt Ice is the better call for the held item here. Now it's not going to cost me, and you still have like a 70% one shot range on the Dragonairs, but if you missed the range and maybe started to take some damage, who knows what could happen. Now it's still clean, but overall I would just say that I had a hard time remembering to swap held items this run. It is what it is. Now this is something that's neither here nor there, but I thought it was pretty funny. Now after you beat Claire, you talk to the Elder Dragon dude. He's uh, asking you some questions about loving Pokemon, and I accidentally answered a question wrong. And I never knew this before, but he just acts like he didn't hear you, and he gives you another chance to answer. And I just kind of crack up at the visual of thinking about this guy being like, "Uh, what? I didn't quite hear you." Just so that you don't fail. I thought it was, I thought it was pretty funny. Moving forward, I'm gonna be picking up the two Cave Candies in World Islands and Mount Mortar, and I'll be battling a lot of trainers on the way to Victory Road, and I think it's actually easier for me just to show you what I didn't battle. There's one trainer, Psychic Richard, or Psychic Dick if you know him well enough. He has a single Espeon, and everything else just kind of gave me enough experience to where I don't need to do this battle. So I fight everything else, and it's on to that final rifle battle. So finally, we get to see how the Paralyzed Cure Berry is supposed to be utilized. I didn't forget it, but first let's get rid of the Sneasel. It's a frail little piece of paper. The easiest strategy here is just a two-shot Magneton with a turn, let it use Thunder Wave, get rid of it with a berry, and then go about your life. But as simple and straightforward as this is, it's why the rival, Jasmine, or the scientist marks of the world were just so annoying in this run, especially before the optimized run. But right here, this is what peak Noctile gameplay looks like. From there, you either have the damage or the coverage to ensure that Golbat and Kadabra just they can't do anything. And if this fight has followed the script up to this point, you should be at full health, facing down a Feraligator that you massively overlevel, and it's pretty much a done deal at that point. Now this fight is not going to look like much, but remember, we see the peak optimized route in my videos, and I think it's very important to talk about the things that gave me problems while routing, and this is one of those fights, but let's fade to black, we have the Elite Four coming up.
Will is up first, and let me keep it real with you guys. The early grinding and the struggles, they paved the way so that the Elite Four as a whole isn't gonna be that bad. Hidden Power Ice along with Never Melt Ice ensures that everything weak to it is gonna go down in one hit. We have the damage for Jinx, and Slowbro is the only thing in general that can survive one hit. And I don't wanna speak too soon, but maybe Noctowl is kinda coming into its own after that slow mid game. Next up we got Koga, and it's not a tough battle at all. Very little to really talk about, but let me share one little piece of advice for you guys. Do not, under any circumstance, use fly or two turn moves in general against Fortress. It will stall you out with Protect because the AI is actually pretty decent in Gen 2, and you're just going to be here for an eternity. I made that mistake in one of my runs. Now, even though Return takes a lot of hits to take it down, it's really your only option. And it's not even like Fly does that much more damage, especially when you take into account it's a two turn move. Outside of that, there's some annoying moves double team, toxic. It, you get through this. Bruno has yet another Pokemon that can be annoying if you use Fly. Hitmontop will protect itself the same way Fortress does, so just save yourself the time. Time. Now you're gonna get slightly chipped down throughout the battle and you have to put in a little bit of thought into Machamp and by thought I mean just don't spam fly. I go for it at the start just to fish to see if I get that really good range for a one shot. I don't and we get to see that juicy rock slide damage. From here Bruno will go for a max potion and two turns is the play if you want to avoid a reset. If you go for fly the two turns essentially makes the max potion free. You're not gonna knock it out and that rock slide will force a reset but if you make it to this point in the battle it's it's over because Hitmonlee it's an easy one shot. Next up we have Karen and guys I'm sad to say Noctowl will not be in the Umbreon one shot club today. Now I know we were all rooting for it but the main thing here is can you avoid sand attack and I do and it's because I'm such a skilled player at Pokemon I hit A better than anyone else in the world. From there everything is essentially a neutral matchup but you do have to deal with curse damage but outside of the Houndoom things like Murkrow and Vileplume they can't really do much and now we're just cruising towards the champion. I don't even need to waste time editing in a fancy champion intro today because this battle is very favorable to Noctowl. Gyarados is not a one shot, but generally it's just going to set up Rain Dance for a free pass. And we have Hidden Power Ice, and with the held item, it ensures that the Dragonites will go down with ease. But I do want to talk about what this battle takes if you just for some reason are a masochist and you don't want to deal with Hidden Power. Without taking vitamins into the equation, level 73 is about your best bet, but even then, Return only has about a 50 50 shot at one-shotting the first two Dragonites, which means you're likely still going to see a Thunder Wave, so it goes without saying that doing it that way is a nightmare. But to cover the rest of the fight, it's still not perfect. Aerodactyl is going to take two hits no matter what, so I just soften it up with Return. Then I take it out, but it will do some solid damage with that illegal Rock Slide before you finally take it out, and I want you guys to focus on Charizard. Finally, in this playthrough, we get to see the bulk of Noctowl as it tanks a Flamethrower with ease, so that's pretty cool. And when you get to the end, the Never Melt Ice ensures that the final Dragonite is also a one-shot, which means overall, the Elite Four was pretty quick. Noctowl is the champion of Johto, and if you haven't noticed, Noctowl has done pretty good since we got past the early little Steel Tops and Morty, and dare I say that it actually felt pretty good to play from that point on, but as we all know, there's still another half of the game left to play, so let's fade to black, and let's quickly cover Kanto. Noctowl is going to continue the trend of not having any problems here. It doesn't struggle in the slightest in this section of the game, and to prove that the best way that I can, I don't even skip Surge. He even has a Magneton on his team, and that just means that it's two returns rather than one, and to make this matchup even better, he doesn't even have Thunder Wave like Scientist Mark does, so this is a non-issue battle, just like the rest of Kanto. The only thing that kind of worried me in practice was Macargo. It resists everything, it takes a ton of hits to take out, and it has Stab Rocks Slide, but for whatever reason, this thing just loves to use Curse. I've seen it go for it for up to like four times in a row, and I guess Blaine just likes to be a degenerate that likes to trivialize the red fight, but if you want to know anything about Kanto, even a double curse stab rock slide doesn't pose a threat to a Pokemon that only has 50 base defense. Blue is also pretty trivial, even with our limited top coverage, to the point to where the only 
interesting thing in this battle was him struggling just to spam out full heals over and over on Arcanine because he doesn't know how to give up. But overall, Noctowl, I would say it had just about as easy of a time as any Pokemon can have through the Kanto portion of the game. Nothing really to talk about here. Looking towards the final battle, I pop a burger into Noctowl's mouth for that sweet leftovers heal. And I have eight candies to get up to level 73, and that's the sweet spot today. Now, there are no learn set changes, and I haven't mentioned this before, but all that Johto pre-elite 4 training was that so I would hit level 65 right after blue for this exact moment, but no more stalling. Let's just see how the red fight goes. Up first is Pikachu, but we outspeed and we have a guaranteed one shot, so Pikachu no longer needs to be in this video any longer. He's gonna bring in Blastoise second, and it has Blizzard. Now, Noctowl is bulky, it can tank these quite well, It'd take like three or four to take me out, but this is a battle of attrition, and this run is gonna feel like Politoed in more than one way, but specifically with the need for hypnosis if you want this fight to be clean. Now, I get it here, it's not bad, but we just, we know the inherent risk of rolling the dice on a 60% accuracy move over and over. Espeon is one of the reasons that I like level 73. With the six Carbos earlier, we speed tie, as well as just pick up some nice damage ranges throughout the fight, like the three shot on Blastoise. But here you're gonna see exactly why Hypnosis kind of sucks sometimes. I miss three times, I lose two of the three speed ties, and I just go down without doing anything, and that's gonna be the first reset on red. So I'm gonna have several resets here. There's like five in total, just like Politoed had on its run. And the first reset is really the only reset that has nothing to do with hypnosis. I guess I do miss the first hypnosis, but I get frozen. You can thaw out in Gen 2, but it doesn't really matter in this situation. It doesn't even happen here. Now the rest of the resets are all, they basically come down to taking too much damage at various points in the fight. Whether it be Blizzard, or maybe Espeon with Psychic, or Snorlax's AI smelling blood in the water and going Super Saiyan with body slams, or barely limping into the Charizard and it finishing me off. I just didn't have the most coin flip luck here today, but just like a lot of things in life, if you keep chipping away at it, eventually some things are going to go your way. Now I have to say that in the winning attempt, it didn't look great because the Snorlax hit a Snore crit to take me to half health, but remember guys, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Now the final obstacle was Charizard. I hit the turn one hypnosis, it stays asleep like a good boy for three turns, and that's all I need to take it out. And finally, on my sixth try, I get to see the Venusaur that Red is desperately trying to hide in the back. And it honestly, it just can't do anything against me. And it doesn't matter what I use. Return, Hidden Power, Eyes, Fly. They roughly take about the same amount of turns with Fly being the slowest route. But I do get it down. And that's the run over. Noctowl finishes the game with a 4 hour, 17 minute, and 57 second time with 8 resets. And these are the kind of runs that I'm like curious about what they're going to be at when we finally look at the tier list. Now I'm trying my best to get one set up for you guys. I want to have 10 properly optimized ranked crystal runs so that I can have a good sample size and make things as accurate as possible so it's still not ready. It'll be ready soon, but I feel like Noctowl, like just going off of feel, it feels like a low B tier, maybe a high C tier, but you guys, you know the reason why I have these formulas and these rankings, it's so that I don't have to guess what a Pokemon's rank. Now, if you made it this far into the video, I really appreciate it a lot. Make sure to leave a like, comment, do all those cool things, help the channel grow. And if you are new, subscribe for more solo run content. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. The support means a lot. And if you are still hearing me talk, you're a real one, comment that down below. And I'll catch you on the next video. Bye.